welcome to the Gospel According to Kennison. And for, unless you're brand new, you know I'm Bill Kennison, your host. And we are coming to you live from cloudy Southern California. But it's still going to be hot. Cloudy or not, it's still going to be hot. And we want to welcome you to our program this morning. I think we've got a, a great one lined up for you. I'm excited. And I'm going to tell you why I'm excited. We just had a beautiful, and I mean good looking. All babies kind of look the same. This one, he looks pretty good. Finnegan Samuel Cottrell came into this world weighing seven pounds, nine ounces, and uh, we're excited. That's our grandson, our first grandson. We have a granddaughter, uh, Scarlet Rose, that just loves him. And you know, when I look into, when I see her eyes and how much love, she's six years old, and how much love she has for this baby and, and how much love this mother and father, my daughter and my, my son-in-law, Devin, Cottrell and my daughter Ginger and uh, you know it, it just makes you wonder where does prejudice and hatred and bitterness where does that come from these little babies come into this world and all they know is love that's all they feel that's that and that's all they give is that actually, I don't care if they're a week old, there's that love, that connection, that bond with that mother. And where does this stuff come from? It has to be learned. It has to be taught. Someone taught them to feel that way. I watched, I watched Scarlett and I don't know how many camps she was in this, this summer. I... Uh, let's see, I know she was in tennis camp and, and uh, won the most improved trophy. I know that she was in uh, church camp. And I know that she spent a week in uh, hip-hop camp dancing and, uh, and a weekend uh, in music theater camp. And, and I watch her. And do you know what? She's six years old. She turned six this past May. And color means nothing to her. Not only her, I watch the other kids. They, they don't recognize that. Race means nothing to them. Politics means nothing to them. They just accept whoever wants to play with them, they'll play. They love to play. And anyone that'll play with them, they accept them. So I'm here to tell you something, folks. We need to go back to being children. We need to go back to that to that innocent time. So don't give me all this this stuff. I watched uh well as much as I could watch of it. I couldn't watch much of it, but uh, I watched uh yesterday the funeral of uh of John McCain. And uh and I thought when they started getting political, I thought this is supposed to be a celebration of his life. Where do we get so twisted and so bitter and so mean? I, 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 don't, I, don't under, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. But anyhow, I want to, uh, I wanted to let you know about the arrival of our little grandson. And uh, God took care of him. It was a battle and uh, they had a few problems, but he's healthy. The mother is healthy. And I was up for... Three three mornings in a row at three o'clock in the morning out walking and talking to God and practicing what we teach here and and declaring victory and declaring a a healthy baby and de declaring a normal birth and and God doesn't fail. God never fails. He's never failed once. Isn't that great confidence that you can have in that? Any anyway, I wanted to I wanted to uh, let you all know right right out of the gate. So now I've got two beautiful grandchildren. I've got Scarlet Rose and, and I have Finnegan Samuel. 
I love that name, Finnegan. Finnegan Samuel, his father's Irish, and, and uh, there's only 400 people in the world named Finnegan, and he's one of them. And so God bless them. Uh, God give uh, the mother the strength, uh, Ginger, to give her recovery and, and strength. And uh, I just I just love sitting there and watching them. I'm not counting. I love holding them and also. But, uh, you know, I'm going to do something else also this morning that I, I ordinarily... Well, I don't remember ever doing it on our on our program, but there's a ministry that I would, uh, if you're in that area or if you go online or or whatever, it's Dr. Uh, Jerry McKinney and his wife Deborah. And I I don't usually endorse ministers and uh, all that, but you know I've read I've read uh, they call him Dr. J and he's also a bishop. I've, I've read his uh, material that he has sent to me, has a very unique ministry. He and Deborah have a very unique ministry and a very uh, unique insight into the kingdom of God. And if you're around them, look them up in Colorado Springs. I know we have many, or I know we have some listeners, I don't know how many, but quite a few, uh, in Colorado Springs, Colorado, which is a beautiful, beautiful place. Years ago, we used to preach, trying to think what the name of the church would, was. I think it's something like Lighthouse Temple. Uh, Reverend Dunbar, which I would assume had probably passed on by now. and But he had a beautiful church. And on Sunday morning, uh, the it was three stories. And uh, they would have these electric curtains and it would open up. And, and it was all glass on one side. And the view was Pikes Peak. And uh, man, it was just it was just beautiful. But you've got a, a beautiful ministry up there. Uh, I met, uh, as far as I can remember, I met uh, uh, Dr. J back in, uh, man, I was a young man and preaching in Athens, Georgia at a convention. And uh, had a great convention, although some of the some of the uh, leading ministers weren't too excited, but uh, the vast majority were. We had fantastic services, and uh, that's where I met uh, Dr. J. Was uh, there he and his beautiful wife, and I think that's the first time I met him. And then, you know, naturally we uh, was met each other in several conventions. He was also uh, there at one of my. Uh, uh, saddest moments in my life when my brother Kevin was murdered and uh, he and his wife were there and were a comfort. Any, anyway, I wanted to just uh, endorse them. I hope they I hope <laughs> they haven't asked me to do this, so I hope that uh, I hope they're endorsing this, but uh, anyhow, if you get a chance, it's it's Dr. Jerry McKinney and uh, you will you will enjoy it. I want to talk a little bit this morning, and especially after having our our grandson, I want to talk about love. And naturally, I'm I'm sure I'm going to take a road that that maybe some of you don't understand. So for the next twenty minutes, just take the foundations of your belief and just set them on the side. I'm not telling you to throw them away or or toss them out or anything. Just set them on the side and try to listen to what I'm I'm going to teach. Uh, to you without without having to try to put it in your old wine skin or put it in that filter that that you uh, filter everything with. You, I want to, we'll start off, if you're going to name a message or a lesson, I guess it would be love begins with loving yourself. Now that was not what I was taught growing up. But that's what we're going to teach this morning and maybe next week. Love begins with loving yourself. You see, life for most people is almost completely ex exterior oriented. Almost completely for most people. We have been conditioned to believe that we come into this life empty and we go out into the world to be filled. So we go to school to get knowledge. We, uh, we go to church to get religion. We go to the marketplace to, 
to get money and security. And we look to certain people in our lives for love. That, that's pretty generally uh, speaking what we, what we do and, and what we uh, come through. You see, love comes natural to us when we find the right person to love or to be loved by. Life for most people, I would say, is a long quest for love. I would say that we desire love more than we desire anything else. I don't know why. Maybe I heard this, this song this morning. But when I was out walking like I do every morning, somehow the, the uh, song, I don't even know all the words, goes, uh, one is the loneliest number that I've ever had, or something like that. Anyhow, I, was, I would just babble along with it. But for, for life for most people is, is a long quest for love. When I told Sherry, what, she asked me, she said, well, what's your lesson going to be on this morning? And I told her, it's going to be on the, well, that's an easy subject. So we'll, we'll see how easy it is. See, the most sordid and depraved lives are really crying out more than anyone else. Won't someone please love me? Think about that. Some of the most sordid, depraved lives that individual has spent their life going, won't someone please love me? You see, our, our need is to love and not just to find someone to love us. I always thought the greatest thing uh, uh, when you find that person and you fall in love isn't so much, and I'm not downplaying it, isn't so much that they love me, but it's really I have someone to love. To me, that was more important when I, when I fell in love with Sherry. It was more important to me that I had her to love, even more important than her loving me because I wanted to give out that love. That's what, that's what love does. You see, with, within every person is a hunger and a thirst to be love. I want you to hear exactly what I said. There's a, in every person, there's a hunger and a thirst to be love. Not just to love somebody, have someone love you. No, there's a hunger and a thirst to be love. To express love. To let the power of love throw or flow through them. There's just that desire. It's a natural desire from when you come into this, into this world. How easy is it to conclude that all the problems of our life have come about because of a father who mistreated us or a mother who did not love us? I mean, that's always been you know, one of the first things the psychiatrist will, will ask is how did your mother and your father uh, treat you. We need to, and I'm going to do it, but we need to define love. We need to define it. Before you start thinking this is the same old uh, song and dance about love and love thy neighbor and everything, listen to what I have to say this morning. It's going to be a little different. We have accepted the biblical statement that God is love. And we accept that, except we accept it as if love were a particular commodity that God, setting up on that throne up in heaven, sent down to us and down into our life from above. That's how we look at it. Actually, that statement was more a description of what God is rather than what he does. God is love. That's more of a, it's really a description 
of what God is. More than, well, God loves everybody. That's not what that scripture is saying. It's saying God is love. Actually, uh, it might be said that, that God is life, God is intelligence, God is power, and God is love. But all this is simply abstract generalizations unless and until we can say whatever else God is, God is me. Woo! I told you it's going to be, going to be a little different. I'll repeat it. It is simply an abstract generalization that unless and until we can say whatever God is, God is me. Now, I'm not talking about you going out here and, and you're being God and everything else, but I am going to tell you God is you. God is me. He made us in his image. You see, God is love, and I am that love. You are that love that is expressing in and through as my loving heart. God is love. Thus, we're gonna, if we're going to accept that, it is not love that is the great need in the lives of people, what they really need is loving. They are love. You are love. The need we have is to be loving. That's a, there's a difference there. There's a difference there. We need to return to the root of our being where we remember that God created man in his image and in the image of God he created him. That's, that's Genesis 1 and 27. Now we all believe the Bible. So if you believe that scripture, then I want to personalize it. God created me in his image and God is love. God created you in his image, and God is love. So if that's true, you are love. I am love. Each of us is created in and of love. Little Finnegan, all he knows to do right now is just love. Just love. That's all he knows. He's come into this world. And he is love. If you don't believe it, look at every child. Look at every baby. Because all they know to do when they come into this world is to love. They, they, you know, when they get, when they, you realize they can smile. How often that we try to, we make them smile. Why? Because they are love. They're made in his image, and in the image of God are we made, and God is love. Well, we haven't got to the tough part here, but we, we'll get there. See, we all, we have all the love we need to love everyone and everything, for everyone and everything are also created in and of love. How do we love other people? We love other people through loving ourselves. I told you, but it had a little different twist. I come into this into this world a long time ago on New Year's New Year's Day in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm sure that all I knew was love. But I grew up in church, Pentecostal church. Every, every service, 
three, four services a week. I remember we had services on Sunday and Wednesday, and then they decided that wasn't enough church, so we had on Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday, and um, we were there. We lived in the church, and we were there every service. You know what I didn't get out of that church? I never got security. I never got confidence. What I, what I really received, and I'm going to be very honest, I didn't get love. They talked about it, but they weren't loving. What I really got growing up in that church was insecurity. Because the least little mistake I made, God held against me. That's how they talked. I'd get saved on Sunday night, just about every Sunday night. Now, I wasn't by myself. The whole church basically got saved every Sunday night. Then we had to go through the week. And God forbid if we cussed. God forbid if we lit up a cigarette. God forbid if we drank a beer. God forbid if uh, our skirts were too short. It just went on and on. We didn't believe in jewelry in our church. So God forbid if you wore a wedding ring. That's not security. That is not love. That's religion. So I grew up not loving myself. How could I love myself? I was continually reminded that I was a sinner saved by grace. But the emphasis was I was a sinner. Then it was saved by grace. A sinner saved by grace. I mean, I, I never understood that. I, I never really understood... Uh, Oh, boy, I shouldn't meddle, but I guess I will. I've never really understood Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I've never really understood that. And one of the reasons is, is that my wife has went through uh, breast cancer. And we're really involved in, in fundraising for the cure and of, of cancer. But, you know, if you're clean five years with cancer, when I say clean, if... For five years, that, re that cancer has not returned. They say you're cured. Al Al Alcoholics Anonymous, you're never cured. Matter of fact, you go the rest of your life. And it's like, it's like part of your name. I'm Bill. I'm an alcoholic. Well, I'm going to tell you something. That's how we were in church. We were always a sinner. Say by grace. We might as well win. I'm Bill. I'm a sinner. They'd all go, hi, Bill. Anyhow, what I'm trying to show you is what love uh, and loving yourself. You cannot love until you get to love yourself. I grew up not loving myself. And, I, and I'm going to lay it to, I'm going to lay it to religion. Now, there's no other way to truly express love except through self-love. Our capacity to love is directly dependent upon our ability with ourselves with a mature self-love. It's directly de dependent on it. That's a, that, as much as you love yourself, that's as much as you can love anybody else. Jeremiah 31 and 3 says this, I loved you with an everlasting love. Love is something that we can never lack because we are love. You may not realize it, but you are. We are love. Love has never just happened to anyone. People spend years of their lives trying to find love. But love is not something to be found. You single people, listen to me. You cannot find love. It's not something that you can find. Love consists not in finding the right person, but in becoming the right person. When you love yourself and you become, uh, you become that right person, you'll draw that person to love. You'll automatically draw them. Religion. 
says to love thy neighbor. Hmm. That's a tough one. Hebrew construction that can only be rendered in the English as this. Love to your neighbor, which means act lovingly towards your neighbor. Act lovingly towards your neighbor. This is the intent of the commandment. Not love him, but be loving. There's a, there's a big difference. To love him deals with something you give him or something you do to him. Being loving deals with your attitude. Being loving deals with your level of perception, the way you see him. Jesus made this commandment. We're going to bring it to a close here. Jesus made this commandment more meaningful when he said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's in Mark 12 and 31. You cannot really know or love another person unless you know and love yourself. It's impossible. I know some of you... Go, oh, well, you know, I, I love Susie, or I love this or that. You cannot love another person unless you know and love yourself. Loving yourself is knowing what you are and rejoicing in it. Loving your neighbor is accepting what he is, which is made possible only as you accept what you are. How many has ever had somebody tell you, you know, I, I have to love you, but I don't have to love your ways. Well, that's not loving, and you don't love them, so don't lie to their face. What you, what, what you love is, is what you're accepting them, that person to be. When you love yourself, you are secure and within independent. You can face the changes in the world without fear because you are love. Well, I love most of you. <laughs> I can't lie to you. I, I don't know all of you that watch me, but I'm trying to be loving to you, and I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. We'll, we'll pick this up uh, next week. Uh, it will transform your life. Somebody said, well, I, I, I've never, I've always taught that, uh, you know, you can't love yourself. Honey, if you don't love yourself, you can't love anyone else. I was talking to Sherry before we started this morning, and it was the truth. I said, I never loved myself until I met you. And then she made, made me realize the person that I was. And... Uh, and that, and, and I, I fell in love with that person. I love me. I'm going to be very honest about it. I'm probably one of the few preachers that's going to tell you that. I love me. Some people think it might be arrogance. I don't care. I love me. I'm around me more than I'm around anybody. And I enjoy me. I want to, uh, I want to remember uh, Roxanne this morning in prayer. She is doing good. They have moved her to a rehab. She's doing a lot better. Also a good friend, Eddie Candela. Uh, is going to have a, a heart procedure this week. We want to remember him in prayer. And then I don't know why. I was just, I was thinking of different families. I was thinking of Gigi this morning. I was thinking of the Willards this morning. And I was just thinking of so many families that have seen their, their loved ones transition to the next level. And we, 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 we try to rejoice in that. And we are supposed to rejoice in it, but sometimes it's not easy. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for the gift of this baby to, to Sherry and I and this Kennison family. I thank you for this opportunity that I have to minister and to teach to these folks. I ask that you open their ears to hear what the truth would say to them. 
and cause it to make them free. If they need a healing this morning, God, I ask you to touch that body. If they need a miracle, I know there's no miracles in you because it's just normal work for them, just a normal process. Give it to them. Bless them emotionally. Bless them financially. I'll give you all the praise. Amen. I want to wish you a, a happy Labor Day tomorrow. Enjoy it with your family or whoever you can. And love yourself. I'll see you next week.